Eastern Canada continues to progress through a chaotic winter, though it is not without its beauties. And for me, being originally from a place where snow never fell, to this very day I can't help but appreciate the stark winter white and jet black beauties of winter. Whether it is grains of ice whipping across dunes of snow, or the glaring whites and impenetrable shadows of the forest scape, I find a northern winter to be a place of beautiful extremes. But whatever the weather is doing, it never stops me from getting out. And Gilly Doo, my faithful border collie, seems to be bulletproof when it comes to the weather. And now we are well and truly into January. A new year, a new start. And so for the year 2020, I've decided to undertake a project I've been meaning to for ages. I have decided to learn more about the lives of our winged neighbors, birds. Many years ago, while studying biology in the Alaskan subarctic, I had a professor who was a bird nut, absolutely loved them, but he used to remark how it was very difficult to study birds because they're so quick. He would spend all day looking for them, find them, and in a blink, they were gone. Well, I've been doing a bit of research and I've decided to work around that problem by setting up several feeding stations around our land. We are in a fairly wild region, and every year we see all manner of birds, nuthatches, hermit thrushes, Canada jays and blue jays, and any number of ravens, crows and raptors, and much more besides. But I do agree with that professor from long ago. The problem with trying to learn about birds is they never stay still. So what I'm going to do is set up several feeding stations around the land. However, I want to do this in a way that is careful to avoid the risk of the spreading of disease, because bird disease spreading at bird feeders has been a problem lately, at least here in Eastern Canada. And the research I've come across has pointed to some successful ways to do this, primarily involving frequently cleaning the feeders and ceasing the feeding of birds if any mortality is found in the area. I intend to monitor these feeders daily, even though they are far back on my land, so frequent monitoring won't be a problem nor will cleaning them, as I'll just pack disinfectant washes with me out every time I go and visit the feeders. This should be a wonderful way to get to experience some of the Norse wild beauties, and even allow me some foraging as I go along. And Gilly Doo won't miss a single chance to romp and play summer or winter with whatever sticks he can find. Well, that's feeding site number one completed. The hollow brook is just beside it. We'll see if it draws in birds that like to have water right nearby, and raptors from the nearby glade. A northern winter is always a thing of beauty, whether it is the snow sparkling like dust of diamonds upon dark stones, or the complex patterns of foliage silhouetted by bright ice, or brook ice trying to form the shape of rosettes, or these delicate snow hairs here. There is beauty to be found everywhere, and little marvels too, such as this track of snowshoe hair, the fading crimson of last year's staghorn sumac, and these bright rowan berries, silhouetted by an even brighter sky that sometimes feed those creatures stalwart enough to brave a northern winter. I figure if a small creature that does not even weigh as much as my hand can overcome a northern winter with nothing but its body and strength of will, that creature is as much a marvel as all the beauty around me and certainly merits attention and study. It appears Gilly Doo feels the same way. And he approves. A day later, I head out to the second site where I'll set up bird feeding stations. Hey buddy. Daddy forgot to bring a string. We gotta make do with something else.
That's about perfect here. Yep. What do you think, Gilly Do? Good spot, buddy? should be good. I had forgotten to bring a string with me, so I used the local sapling to support the bird feeder. It was getting late, so I returned to the cottage, and the next day, I'll return with the string to set up the suet melt. Well, the weather of Eastern Canada is nothing if not chaotic. We had a day of blizzards, a day of calm weather, and now, a day of pouring rain. But no weather stops a devoted naturalist. So rain or not, Gilly Doo, who is naturally almost weatherproof, and I, simply wearing a warm coat, brave the January rain and head back to the second feeding station. And this time, I remembered to bring string. So it is short work to set up a hang for suet, which I decided to put up on a drier day. What really took time in this weather was setting up the camera. The touchscreen objected strongly to functioning in this downpour, and the rain kept turning the camera to modes that I really didn't care for. But in short order, the work is done. When I return, I'll set up trail cams at each site and carry regular cameras with me, and we'll see what avian wildlife find their way to us. Now back to the cottage to warm up beside the wood stove and enjoy a cup of hot tea and hot soup and look forward to another dark night here in the wild wood at Twa Corby's Hollow. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist program is committed to the reliable coverage of all matter of topics relating to natural science. From ecology and conservation, to the nature of the universe beyond our Earth, and making that information practical with solid advice on living well with the natural world. If you appreciate the program, please take a moment to subscribe. Subscribing costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps a lot.